This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an online course on number theory for undergraduates. Uh, this is a continuation of the previous lecture on primes and will be mostly about arithmetical functions. Um, so an arithmetical function is just a function from the integers or the positive integers 1, 2, 3 to um, well anything it could be the complex numbers or the reals or even just the integers again. So it's just a function defined on positive integers and there are some obvious examples. We could just have fn is some power of n like n to the k. Um, this is the property that f of mn is equal to f of m times f of n. And functions with this property are particularly interesting. They're called strictly multiplicative. We'll see what um, non-strictly multiplicative functions look like a little bit later. Um, so powers of n are the most obvious strictly multiplicative ones, but there are also some other examples. Um, for instance, we could have a function which looks like this. So fn um, just looks like this. So here's n and fn is just going to go 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, and so on. So it just repeats with period 4. So it's equal to, to 1 if n is equal to 4m plus 1, minus 1 if n equals 4n plus 3, and naught if n is even. And you can again notice that this is multiplicative. It has this pro property here. Um, later on, we will um, have some very important examples of strictly multiplicative functions called the Legendre symbol um, given by fn is equal to np where this is not a binomial coefficient it will be something we define later that tells you whether or not n is is a is a square or not um, modulo p. Um, this example and this example are both examples of things called Dirichlet characters which will again be turning up um, later on in the course. So Dirichlet char character is, is strictly multiplicative and it also takes values that are complex numbers of absolute value 1. Um, another example of a strictly multiplicative function is the Liouville function, which is sometimes known by lambda of n. And lambda to the n is easy to define. It's just equal to minus 1 to the power of omega of n. OK, well, great. So what's omega of n? Omega of n is equal to the number of prime factors um, counted with multiplicities. For example, if you take the number 60, this is equal to 2 squared times 3 times 5. So omega of 60 is equal to 2 plus 1 plus 1. So there should be an exponent 1 there and so on. So, so it's got four prime factors, except you have to count two twice because it's got an exponent of two. If you don't want to count primes with multiplicity, there's another function called little omega, where, where, where little omega of 60 would just be three, because here you, 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 you don't count primes with repetition. Um, anyway, you notice that omega of big omega of mn is equal to omega of m plus omega of n, which easily implies that lambda of m n is equal to lambda of m times lambda of n. Um, little omega doesn't have this property, so it's, uh, it's rather harder to deal with than the, 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 than the big omega function. Um, well, these are all strictly multiplicative functions, and it turns out that this condition is really too strong. What we really want are multiplicative functions which have the following property. They have the property that f of m n is equal to f of m times f of n if m and n are co-prime. That means they've got no common factors. This seems to be a slightly funny looking condition, but it turns out there are lots of natural functions with this property. So I'll now give some examples of them. So here's the first example. Um, we could take the divisor function, denoted by d of n or sigma 0 of n, which is just the number of divisors 
of n. So let's just look at a few examples. If we take n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we look at the divisors. Here we've got 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 5, 1, 2, 3, 6. So d of n is just given by 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4. Um, more generally, if n is prime, the only factors are 1 and p, so um, d of n is just 2, um, so it can be quite small. Um, on the other hand, if n has a lot of factors, for instance, if it's the factorial of something, or if it's something like 60, um, well, how many divisors does 60 have? Well, this is a little bit complicated because you can see there's, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7, no, 8, no, 9, no, 10. No, uh, and this is getting a little bit tedious to count them. Um, is, there a, is there a better way? Well, well, yes, there is, because what we do is we use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and write 60 as a product of prime powers. And now you can see a divisor of n must be of the form 2 to the a times 3 to the b times 5 to the c, um, where a is less than or equal to 2, b is less than or equal to 1, and c is less than or equal to 1. So there are three choices for a, because you remember we allow a to be 0 as well, and there are two choices of b and two choices for c. So, so d of 60 is, um, is going to be 3 times 2 times 2, which is 12. And obviously, we can do the same for any integer. If, if we know the prime factorization of an integer, so it could be p1 to the n1, p2 to the n2, and so on, then d of this number is equal to n1 plus 1 times n2 plus 1, and so on. Um, so if we know the prime factorization, then it's easy to work out the number of divisors. Um, you also see that this immediately shows that... Um, um, the, the number of divisors of n is multiplicative. So this is equal to d of m times d of n if m and n are co-prime. Because if they're co-prime, then the, the formula for d of m times the formula for d of n is just the same as d m n. If m and n are not co-prime, then this fails. Um, for, for example, if, if, if we look at d of 4, this is equal to 3. But d of 2 is equal to 2, and d of 4 is not equal to d of 2 times d of 2. Um, the, the, the trouble is the, 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 the factor 2 kind of um, overlaps um, when we write in, I mean, the, the factor of 2 there kind of interferes with the 2 there. So, so the divisor function is multiplicative, but it's not strictly multiplicative. So let's have some more examples of multiplicative functions. Um, another one is the sigma of n, which is the sum of the divisors. Um, so let's try and work out what is sigma of 60. Um, I'm sorry, my sigmas look a bit like sixes. I'm not quite sure what to do about that. Um, so um, 60 we saw is equal to 2 squared times 3 times 5. So, so the divisors are of the form 2 to the a times 3 to the b times 5 to the c. And we want to sum over all a's from 0 to 2 and all b's from 0 to 1 and all c's from 0 to 1. So we, we, we want to sort of sum these numbers. So we're summing all numbers. So, so the numbers of the form, well, it can be 1 plus 1 or 2 or 2 squared times 1 or 3, times 1 or 5. And if we sum over all these, what we're going to get is obviously 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared, times 1 plus 3, times 1 plus 5. Because if we expand this out, we see we get one of these possible factors each time. So, so this is the sum of the divisors of 60. We just take 7 times 4 times 6 which is much easier than just finding all the devices and adding them up. And again, exactly the same thing works for any integer. If n is equal to p1 to the n1 times p2 to the n2 and so on, then by the same argument, sigma of n, we get by taking 1 plus p1 plus, plus all the way up to p1 to the n1. And then we do the same for p2. 
and the same for P3 and so on. And we just multiply these up. And you notice this is a geometric series and we know how to add up geometric series. This is just P1 to the N1 um, plus one minus one divided by P1 minus one. And this is the same thing as P2 to the N2 plus one minus one over P2 minus one and so on. So this gives us a, a, a nice formula for, for sigma of N provided you know the um, prime factorization. Um, in fact, um, working out sigma of n is actually quite similar in difficulty to working out the prime factorization. For example, if, if n is a product of two primes, then sigma of n is equal to p plus 1 times q plus 1 which is equal to n plus p plus q plus 1. So if, if you happen to know n is a product of two primes and you know the sum of the divisors of n, then you can work out p plus q and you also know p times q. So p and q both satisfy a quadratic equation whose coefficients you know and you can easily use that to solve for um, p and q. So, so, so finding sums of divisors of a number is about as difficult as finding the prime factorization. Um, um, so another example of a multiplicative function that we're going to see later is Euler's phi function. So phi of n is the number of um, numbers less than n that are co-prime less than root to n that are co-prime to n. So let's just work out a few values. If n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 then um, the numbers co-prime to n um, between um, 1 and n, here we get 1, here we just get 1, here we get 1 and 2, here we get 1 and 3, here we get 1, 2, 3, 4 and here we get 1 and 5. So phi of n becomes 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 2. And if n is a prime, then numbers are 1 up to p minus 1. So phi of n is p minus 1. And you can see that this is the, 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 the biggest, um, biggest it can possibly be. Phi of n is obviously at most n. In fact, it's equal to n only if n is equal to 1. Um, and we will see later that phi of m n is equal to phi of m times phi of n if m and n equals 1. I'm not going to prove this now, but when we do the Chinese remainder theorem a bit later, we will, we, we will see this. For instance, you can see that phi of 6 is equal to phi of 2 times phi of 3. So it, it at least works in that case. Um, you also notice that this is false if m and n are not co-prime in general. For instance, the value for 4 is not the square of the value for 2. Um, so all of these multiplicative functions, it's fairly easy to see their multiplicative. Um, so here's an example where it's rather harder to see that the function is multiplicative. Um, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the following funny looking function, I'm going to take q times 1 minus q to the 24 times 1 minus q squared to the 24 times 1 minus q cubed to the 24 and carry on like this. And I'm going to multiply this all out. Well, I'm not going to multiply it all out because I'm lazy. I'm just going to look up what the answer is. And the answer is it's equal to q minus 24q squared plus 252q cubed. Um, plus 1472q to the 4, plus 4830q to the 5, minus 6048q to the 6. I actually think I've got a minus sign wrong there, but never mind. And you notice um, that if we write this as sum of tau n q to the n, so this is tau 2 and this is tau 6, you might notice that tau of 6 is equal to tau 2 times tau of 3. And Ramanujan noticed that tau of m n seems to be equal to tau of m times tau of n whenever m and n are co-prime. So this was actually proved by Mordell shortly afterwards. So it's um, um, a, a, an example of a multiplicative function where it's not at all obvious that it's multiplicative. 
And you might think, what happens if you change 24 to some other number? And if you change 24 to some other number, it's nearly always not multiplicative. I mean, I think there's a one or two cases when you can sort of get it to be multiplicative. But this is, this is basically a funny property that doesn't work for anything bigger than 24. Um, um, another example of a useful multiplicative function is the Moebius function. So this function is defined, denoted by mu of n. That's actually a, a, a Greek letter mu. You can see it actually does look a bit like an m. That's where our m comes from. So mu of n is defined as follows. It's um, uh, zero if n is divisible by a square greater than one. And it's equal to minus one to the um, omega n if n um, div is divisible by omega of n primes. And when you first come across this definition, it looks kind of stupid. I mean, you know, why on earth would you define a function in this rather bizarre looking way? Um, well, before we explain why, first of all, you notice that mu of m n is equal to mu of m times mu of n whenever m and n are co-prime. So it is at least a um, multiplicative function. It's a bit like the Liouville function, which was strictly multiplicative, except you've made it zero whenever n is not divisible, whenever n is divisible by a square. Well, now I have to justify why you should introduce such a funny looking function. I'll just give one, one justification for it. So suppose we take the Riemann zeta function, zeta of n equals 1 over 1 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n and so on. So it's the most notorious function in number theory. Um, now if you work out 1 over zeta of s, I'm going to change n to s here because I'm or thinking of s as being a complex variable. This turns out to be 1 over 1 to the s plus mu of 2 over 2 to the s plus mu of 3 over 3 to the s and so on. So Moebius's function turns up in the coefficients of the inverse of the Riemann zeta function. And since the Riemann zeta function is perhaps the most important mysterious function in number theory, this justifies why you should take the Moebius function seriously. Um, um, now I want to give an application of multiplicative functions to perfect numbers. So you remember a perfect number is a number that's the sum of its proper divisors. So 6 for example is the simplest perfect number. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, perfect numbers are not really a terribly serious part of number theory, but this will be a sort of good exercise in, in working with um, some of these multiplicative functions. And the problem is to find perfect numbers, and 6 is perfect and 28 is perfect, so this is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. Um, so um, the sum of all proper divisors is half of the sum of the divisors. So what we're doing is trying to solve 2n is equal to sigma of n. So we want the sum of all divisors to be twice the number. Um, and um, we know what sigma n is um, in terms of the prime factorization of n. So if n is equal to p1 to the n1 times p2 to the n2, then sigma of n, you remember, is um, 1 plus p1 plus all the way up to p1 to the n, 1 times 1 plus p2 and so on and so on. Um, and now um, Euclid, um, in his book on the elements, everybody says it's all about geometry, but that's actually a lot of, about a lot of things other than geometry. Um, he gave a way of finding um, perfect numbers. He said if you take a, a number 2 to the p minus 1 times 2 to the p minus 1 such that this is prime and p is also, you remember if 2 to the p minus 1 is prime then p also has to be prime so p is going to be some prime. 
Anyway, this number here is now perfect. And uh, this is actually a rather easy calculation. All we do is we expand out um, this. So, so, so since this is prime, we know the prime factorization of this number, and we just have 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus all the way up to plus 2 to the p minus 1. Um, so that's the that's this bit for the 2 to the p. And then we have 2 to the p minus 1 plus 1 here. So that's that bit there. And this is equal to 2 to the p minus 1. And this bit is equal to 2 to the p. And if you compare that with this, see if n is equal to that number here, this is just equal to 2n. So this number is perfect. And this gives you the first few perfect numbers. For example, for p equals 2, we get um, 2 times 2 squared minus 1. And if p equals 3 here, we get 2 squared times 2 cubed minus 1, which is 4 times 7, which is 28. And you can easily find the next one. For instance, if we take p equals 5, we get 2 to the 4 times 31, which is the next perfect number. Um, well, there's actually a nice converse to this found by Euler. Any even perfect number is of this form. And let's just show you how to prove this using, using the formula for the sums of the divisors. Um, so suppose our number is 2 to the a times p to the b times q to the c and so on, where p and q and so on are various odd primes. So we're going to take our number n to be this, and we're assuming it's perfect. Um, and we can look at all the factors of it, and the factor is going to be we, we, we take 1 or 2 or 4 up to 2 to the a times 1 or p or p squared up to p to the b, and um, some factor of this and so on. So, so, so these are the divisors of n. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take some of the divisors. So I'm going to take the divisors where the, 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 the part here is either p to the b or p to the b minus 1. And for this one, I'm only going to take q to the c. And let's work out what we get here. Well, the sum of these special divisors is 1 plus 2 plus, plus 2 to the a times p to the b plus p to the b minus 1 times q to the c and so on. And I'm now going to add these all up. So this is just um, um, 2 to the a plus 1 minus 1. And this is just p plus 1 times p to the b minus 1. And you can see that this number is equal to 2 to the n times um, 1 minus 1 over 2 to the a minus 1 times 1 plus 1 over p. So, um, 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 now we notice that th th this bit here must be at most 1 because the sum of all divisors has to be 2n and the sum of some of the divisors is this and the sum of all of them is going to be at least that. On the other hand, we notice that this number here is odd and um, since this product here is equal to 2n, this must be divisible by some prime factor of n. So if p is the smallest prime factor of n, then p is less than or equal to 1 plus 2 plus plus all the way up to 2 to the a. Now, um, from the fact that p is less than or equal to 2 to the a plus 1 minus 1, um, we see that this factor here must be greater than or equal to 1. If p is equal to 2 to the a plus 1 minus 1, you can easily check this expression as 1. And if p is less than that that, that, that makes this even bigger. So on the one hand, this expression must be at most 1. And on the other hand, it must be at least 1. So we see that it must be exactly equal to 1. Well, if it's exactly equal to 1, then um, we can't have any other divisors. Um, so in particular, this implies b must be equal to 1. It implies we can't have any other primes q dividing it. 
so QR and so on do not exist. And it also implies that P is equal to 2 to the A plus 1 minus 1. So in other words, our number is equal to 2 to the A times um, times 2 to the a plus 1 minus 1. In other words, it's just one of these Mersenne primes that, that we discussed earlier. Um, so, um, so this gives us all the even perfect numbers, and it leaves two problems. Are there an infinite number of even perfect numbers? Well, since these correspond exactly to primes of the form 2 to the p minus 1, we can ask, are there infinitely many primes of the form 2 to the p minus 1? And we don't know. The answer is probably yes. Um, and people have found about 40 or 50 of them by computer. Um, the largest that have been found absolutely enormous, the largest known, at least according to Wikipedia this morning, was 825899. Um, 3, 3, minus 1, which has about 25 million digits if you try and write it out. In other words, you need an entire bookshelf of books just to write down this prime number. Um, as you see, you can't possibly check these things of primes by checking all prime factors up to their square root. I mean, that would be just absurd. Um, fortunately, there are much faster ways of checking whether Mersenne, prime, whether Mersenne numbers are actually primes. Um, in fact, there used to be something called the, 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 the sort of Mersenne Internet Prime Search, where, where people would use spare computer time on their computers to help search for new Mersenne Primes. Um, I think people have stopped doing this to a large extent, because um, if you've got spare cycle time on your computer, it, you, you, you don't use it for looking for Mersenne Primes anymore. You use it for mining Bitcoin instead, which is more profitable. So um, whatever. Um, um, and um, this is another example of one of these very simple questions that anyone can ask. Are there infinitely many primes of the form 2 to the p minus 1? And this seems to be hopelessly out of reach of any techniques we have at the moment. Um, the, 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 there's just none of our techniques come even close to this. Um, so we can't tell whether there are an infinite number of perfect numbers. There's also another question that you can ask. Are there any odd perfect numbers? And nobody knows. People have tried to answer this, and, and you can put some very restrictive conditions on your perfect number. For example, suppose your perfect number is p1 to the n1 times p2 to the n2, and so on. Then... Um, um, sigma of n must be equal to 2n, which must be divisible by exactly 1 power of 2, because n is odd. And if you expand this out, you see this is 1 plus p1 plus all the way up to plus p1 to the n1, and the same for p2. And you notice that if n1 is odd, this sum is even, and if n1 is even, this is odd. So, 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 so let's say this is odd if and only if n1 is even. Now, if, if this product is two times an odd number, exactly one of these must be um, uh, even. And that means that almost um, almost all these exponents here must be odd. So um, this says exactly one of the ni is odd. So in other words, the number n can actually be written as a square times a prime, um, because one of these numbers is odd, and it's going to be that prime times, times something with all exponents even. So it's a prime times a square. And you can push this sort of argument much further and find much more restrictive conditions on odd perfect numbers. But it's very frustrating if you do this because you never quite get a contradiction. And nobody's been able to prove that perf odd perfect numbers don't exist. And people have done computer searches and haven't been able to find any, so nobody knows. And this is, this is another of these really annoying problems that are um, easy to state and in some sense of kind of almost pointless, but 
We just have no idea how to solve them. Um, in fact, this is a good candidate for one of the oldest problems we don't know how to solve. Um, you know, it's people were discussing this problem about 2,000 years ago, um, and we still don't know the answer. I, I'm not quite sure if it's the oldest unsolved problem, because I'm not an expert on Greek mathematics, but um, I don't offhand know of any older problems we don't know the answer to. Um, so um, I'll just finish by listing Landau's collection of really hard problems. So, so these are Landau's problems about primes that he stated um, about the beginning of last century and just show us how little we know about primes. So these are some more questions that are quite easy to state, but we have no idea how to answer. So... Um, First of all, we have the Goldbach conjecture. Is any even number greater than 4 the sum of 2 primes? So um, next we can ask the twin prime conjecture. So can we find infinitely many primes, P1 minus P2, with difference 2? Um, thirdly, we can ask, suppose we take a number n squared. Can we find a prime between n squared and n plus 1 squared. So that's saying, is the gap between prime between numbers at most the square root of the number? In fact, we think the gaps are a lot less than that, but even this case seems to be out of reach of what we can do. Um, finally, can we find infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus 1? And again, the answer to this seems to be the answer to these, all these four questions is almost certainly yes. We can give probabilistic arguments suggesting they're rather likely to be true, but they're all just out of reach of any techniques we've got these days. Um, OK, um, next lecture will be on binomial coefficients.